Professor Milson, you've had a very illustrious career and it's a great privilege to interview you for the Eminent Scholars Archive. Your reminiscences will be a valuable contribution to the faculty history, stretching back to before the Second World War. You have a formidable reputation as a legal historian, and I hope that during these interviews you'll be able to recount the highlights of your life and career, and perhaps in our last conversations in a few weeks' time we can have a general discussion of your scholarly work. So could we start by talking about your early life, your childhood, your school days. You were born in 1923 in Merton, Surrey. Yeah, that's right, yes. Um, we, The family moved from that house to another one in Wimbledon. Um, and my poor father was secretary of the London Hospital, which was, it's now the Royal London, it was the biggest voluntary hospital in England, possibly in the world. Um, and uh, it's in Whitechapel, so that living in Wimbledon wasn't the ideal starting point. For <laughs> <laughs> and he used to toddle off, and uh, th four times a year, he would toddle down the road in full morning dress with Topper and the lot, because this was the quarterly court of governors who were very grand people. Right. And um, uh, if the truth be told, he looked a right child. <laughs> 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 but, um, uh, and after uh, we'd had for some years um, a holiday cottage in Cornwall and um, the Wimbledon house was bombed not uh, not destroyed but damaged um, and so the family moved to Cornwall uh, uh, where I was based throughout most of my school days for um, your mother, I noticed, was from New Zealand. She's a New Zealander, yes. Yes. Her, her father um, qualified as a doctor in England at St George's Hospital um, and incidentally played rugger for England. So, um, uh, and the whole... The whole of that side of the family were sporting toffs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he had, no, in, in those days, if you wanted to practice medicine, you had to buy a practice, and he had no capital to buy a practice. So he took a job to accompany an invalid on a world cruise, and the invalid died. Um, as they were nearing New Zealand. And my grandfather got off and thought New Zealand looked rather nice. Yeah. Uh, so he stayed and hung up a brass plate and practised in Wellington all his life. Um, and my mother had an idyllic childhood, I think. I think I'm right in saying she was the New Zealand latest golf champion when she was 14. <laughs> and uh, she um, she played in the Open Championship in England but she didn't get all that far with it but she was a very good golfer um, she uh, I'm sorry it's this Pembroke College doing its Damnedest, I hope that gets on. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mother's brother came to England to go to Trinity, um, where he was still a very, very unusual combination. He was a cricket and a rowing blue. Um, 
and uh, he met my father and they were both rather lonely souls so they became friendly and my mother I think at the age of 15 was at school in Wickham Abbey and she was allowed to go to the Trinity May Ball um, I can't help feeling somebody <laughs> slipped up <But> anyway <laughs> she had a whale of a time and met my father and uh, uh, eventually they got married and um, settled in Merton and then in Wimbledon and my father did this job at the London Hospital and my mother played golf and tennis and sent my brother and me off to a little a baby school it was in fact a girls school, the Wimbledon High School for Girls a very grand establishment um, did, took in in those days, one class of little boys to enable their mothers to go and play golf. <laughs> this was before the days of working mothers. Um, and uh, so my brother and I went there and then we were sent off to a prep school in which I think we got the name wrong. On The, the prep school was in Guildford. Um, we haven't got the name, it doesn't matter at all. And from there, uh, we both, he was four years ahead of me, so, but one after the other we went on to Charterhouse. Um, where when it came to specialising, I became a, what they grandly called a science specialist. Right. Um, and I did higher school certificate in physics and chemistry. <laughs> I wondered at what point your interest had been generated in science. Well, it was there to start with, I think. Um, Even before you went to Charterhouse? Yeah, I, I never had any doubt that I was going to go and do what I could with the, the sciences. And I went up from Charterhouse to Trinity with my trunk full of books on physics and chemistry, uh, intending to do the natural sciences tripos. And my tutor um, great blow to me. He said, look, we've been looking through your record and you're okay at physics and chemistry but your mathematics is hopeless. And it's no good trying to be a scientist in the 20th century without being a good mathematician. So you better do something else. So what will you do? So I said, English. And he said, want to be a schoolmaster? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, law. And he said, done. <laughs> it sounds a bit like Maitland's. <laughs> um, so... Um, so really, it was at school that your interest began in science. Oh, yes, yes. Mm. And um, before we actually move on to your time at Trinity, do you have any recollections of your days at boarding school? Not that could be repeated. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it was all right. Mm -hmm. It was all right. I hated it. I think we mostly hated it. Um, uh, Charterhouse sends me every year its annual journal, lavishly illustrated, with top quality photographs of good looking young women. Because they now have girls as well. I noticed that actually yes. when I went to their website. Yes. <laughs> yes, I wondered. Um, mm. And um, uh, I, I'm sure they're doing fine. I, I never went back. I did, after we married, I did drive my my wife down to Charterhouse and we drove around the school grounds because I thought she ought to see it. <laughs> 
but we didn't get out. (laughs) (laughs) Professor Milson, you went up to Trinity College in 1941. Mm -hmm. We're now at your Trinity War Service and Bar period Mm -hmm. of life from 41 to 47. Um, what was life like at Trinity College in those days? Must have been a period of rationing, perhaps, in the aftermath and well during the war. Well, it was peculiar because there were, um, uh, there were only um, the semi-invalids like myself. Uh, all you know, all the healthy young men were away fighting. When you say semi-invalid. How do you mean? Professor I had knocked my head in in 1938, I think it was. And uh, um, I was very lucky to be alive. Um, I was taken to the hospital in Plymouth where... Uh, um, uh, charming old surgeon cleaned up my head and said, well, look, I can't do anything more. We just have to see what happens. And uh, he didn't expect me to live. Um, you must have been um, about 15 then? Yeah. Right. How awful. Uh, and my father um, rang the London Hospital to try to get hold of um, Hugh Cairns, who was the, uh, neuros- the neurosurgeon at the time. He was the pioneer of neurosurgery in England. And he was, he was just returning with the Mitford girl who had shot herself. <laughs> um, and he, he had to disentangle himself from her. But he came down uh, to Plymouth and ha- had me removed to the London Hospital. Um, those were the days. Um, uh, I, he, he said, you can't possibly, he, he'll never survive a journey by ambulance. I'll lay on an ambulance train. <laughs> and he did. Were you conscious at the time? Mm, yes. Yes, I, I was conscious most of the time, actually. And I could hear what he was saying, which wasn't a great comfort to me. But, mm. but uh, still, um, he got me to London Hospital and then he moved off to Oxford as the... Um, first Snuffield Professor of Surgery and um, all this is rubbish to be thrown away as it were Um, I was sent home and a dressing was done on my forehead every day for a year and it wouldn't heal and my nose dripped and eventually um, somebody had the wit to put a test tube under and find out what it was, and it was cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, so I, I had a puncture, as it were. And um, so uh, from the London I was taken to the Rad- Radcliffe Infirmary in Oxford, where he... Um, opened me up and mended it with a sort of puncture of a kit, if you see what I mean. Oh, an extraordinary <laughs> was ordeal. Extraordinary story. Yes. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we're back in 1935, 36, no, 37, I think. And um, nearly all his patients survived the operation. Hardly any survived much longer, if you know what I mean. <laughs> must have been so daunting. Mm. What an ordeal for your parents as well. Awful for them. Awful Awful for them. I I was happily unconscious of how serious it was. Um, I do remember 
actually, uh, he was looking at it and he said, yes, well, we have torn away a bit of brain. And I heard this, but my mind rationalized brain into membrane. <laughs> so I still didn't realize how, how serious it was, how lucky I was, actually. Yes. And I was in and out of hospital for about a year. And I suppose I then went back to school. I did. I went back to Charterhouse. Uh, and yeah. there was no... Uh, the, you know, I had call-out papers, but of course they couldn't call me up. No. Uh, so uh, I was told to go up to Cambridge and just pretend life was normal. Um, uh, I said, well, shouldn't I do some other war work? And they, the, the, these were the military people interviewing me. They said, no, you go and make yourself into a real person because there aren't going to be many of them around. Right, mm. absolutely. And um, so I was sent up to uh, a life of luxury in Cambridge. Cambridge is a very strange place. I mean, you know, the, absolutely. The, um, uh, all the young dons were away. Um, Kurt Lipstein would have been around. Lipstein was around, and Glanville Williams was around, right. and um, dear old Buckland lectured in Roman law. Um, I remember when I was reading in your um, one of your pieces, your, in your studies in the history of the common law, that you remembered his lectures with pleasure as rather mathematical. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, he, yes, he liked to work things out in front of you. And he liked you to follow. And being wartime, there were, weren't many of us. So he felt entitled to ask questions around the class. Um, and uh, I was his, as it were, anchor man. Uh, <laughs> he would end up with me and expect to get the answer. And once I said, I'm afraid I don't know. Of course you don't know if you don't come to my lectures. Must. <laughs> I'd missed one lecture the previous week to go for an interview for my war job. <laughs> he, uh, he was... A very short man, and he was well on in his eighties, so that to stand throughout a lecture would have been an ordeal. But the squire, the um, the old law faculty, for all I know, they're still around, had these lecturer's seats with a desk and a chair, and the chair was. So the lecturer felt like it could stand up behind the desk or he could sit down. But if you were Buckland and sat down, you couldn't see over the desk. So being an engineer by training... Really? Yes. He said he'd built a couple of dismal bridges. <laughs> um, so he would poise this blasted seat at 45 degrees and poise him... <laughs> And the, there would come a point at which he would get excited <laughs> and the thing would lose its balance and drop and he would bounce up and down. And, oh, we were horrid, we were so so amused. <laughs> he, he really was a great man. And in the, uh, the... Have you ever been in the old square? I have actually, yes. Yes, well that was, that was quite a staircase up. Yes. And um, uh, he fell on the stairs one day and broke an arm. And uh, everybody expected him to get an ambulance or a taxi and go home. Instead, he went out to do his shopping. He said, those shops have been letting me down for long enough and now I'm in a bad temper, I'm going to say what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. 
the... I'm sure the shopkeepers had a ghastly morning. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a very kindly man. And um, so was Winfield, uh, whom I got to know rather better because they, the Winfield family used to, for their summer holidays, rent a rather grand house near to where my parents had settled in Cornwall. And um, they asked us to meals and things. And, Lovely. Um, he was... Very, very deaf. And uh, do we have supervisions, we call them now, don't we? I still lapse into the Oxford language and call them tutorials. Anyway, um, a supervision with Winfield was daunting because he couldn't hear a word I said. <laughs> 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 and uh, I howled away hopelessly. <laughs> But um, we got on, and he was actually extremely good to me. Um, I think it was Old Winfield who persuaded, when I had become a prize fellow, Trinity, a research fellow, I think he persuaded Trinity to take me on uh, as a staff fellow. Right. Um, and... Uh, so there I was, set as an academic. And you were reading, uh, not law, Professor Mills? Yes. Right. Yeah. Because um, I was very interested in one of your remarks in The Natural History of the Common Law. In your introduction, page 8, you say of yourself, you, you describe yourself as one who, t and I quote, turned reluctantly from natural sciences to the law, and you could never quite suppress a hankering for test tubes. <laughs> I wondered whether you'd actually, whether your interest was chemistry because of that, or and whether you'd actually had an opportunity. No, I don't know. I, uh, I was I was very very upset when when I went up to Trinity and my tutor said you you better not read uh, read natural sciences. You won't mathematics up not up to it. Um, and I was uh, distressed. But um, the law had the one great advantage over, for example, history or English or most other subjects, in that one thing follows from another. <laughs> 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 or more or less. <laughs> it any rate looks as though everything follows from something. Right. <laughs> and that was comforting to one who would have liked to be a scientist. Yeah. Actually, I enjoyed it. Professor Wilson, during this time, did you meet Professor Guthridge at all? Was he about? No. Uh, well, I suppose I met him in the street, mm -hmm. but um, uh, I doubt if I ever exchanged words with him. Was Hazeltine around at any point? Uh, Hazeltine had had gone to the States. Back to the States. Professor Holland? Very much around, yes described by Professor Jolovitz as really sort of setting the mould for the modern faculty in terms of administration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Harry Holland did did set up the faculty as it uh, now exists, certainly. He was a, a very intimidating character. Um, when I went down, when, when I ceased to be an undergraduate, I went to call on him to thank him for all he'd done for me. And he was living in an attic set in Neville's Court in Trinity. And I think I'm quoting verbatim, I think all these stairs are a bit too much for me and so does my mother, but my grandmother says nonsense. <laughs> There he was, just on the verge of retirement. Um, uh, 
<laughs> he didn't make it to a hundred. Um, his grandmother did, and his his his. I think his mother did too, actually. Um, I met. He insisted on my wife and me going to visit his mother and sisters in their very grand house near Bury St Edmunds. Um, it was a grand place. Um, and the gardener's cottage uh, had absolutely everything, all mod con, but they didn't. <laughs> Earth, earth closet. <laughs> By choice, I mean, there was more money than you could shake a stick at. <laughs> His father had been uh, a merchant in India, I don't know what in, but had made a fortune. Um, uh, so there was a lot of money most of which eventually went to Trinity. Uh, they got, he and his wife got married when he was living in rooms in Trinity and she was living in rooms in Girton. She was Bursa of Girton. And they were as happy as anything <laughs> and occasionally went off for weekends <laughs> together. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Um, well, he retired, but th that didn't make a difference because Trinity doesn't throw out at the old. So he was, could stay in his rooms. But she retired from Girton. And so they uh, they had to go and buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> Live together. <laughs> a rude shock. <laughs> I, I think the house, is that in Story's Way, the but, top of Story's Way? The house that they bought. It's it's near Churchill College. It is, uh, but it's not in Stories Way. It's in Maddingley that, Road. That's right. It's, a lovely, uh, it's probably still road. called the Stone House, and I think it's now Barrister's Chambers. That's right. Yes. Yes. yes and it was an, a very nice house to to live in. Uh, very comfortable. Lovely limestone. Mm. Yes. Yes, that's that's why they bought it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it had to look right. You know, yes. know they were both pretty choosy people. <laughs> a semi in uh, in Barton Road wouldn't have done at all. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Wilson, do you did you remember perhaps Professor Wade at that time? Yes. Emlyn Wade, Emlyn yes. Wade. Um, I got to know him quite well because um, the Foreign Office allowed itself to get into a cockeyed dispute with the French government over some miserable rocks uh, in the English Channel. Um, they're near, near Jersey and Guernsey, but they're separate. And uh, there was a dispute over the ownership of these rocks, which didn't matter to anybody, but they did carry very valuable fishing rights. Uh, so it did matter. But instead of... Se doing a nice treaty and just dividing up the fishing rights, the Foreign Office foolishly decided to take it to the International Court. And um, the legal advisor to the Foreign Office at the time, a man called Sir Eric Beckett, had been a pupil of Emlyn Wade's. And he yelled to Emlyn for help. And Emlyn yelled at me. <laughs> so uh, Emlyn Wade and I spent months and months um, over these wretched rocks. Very interesting. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. 
um, we we were taken to see them. Um, we went in the states of Burgess, the states of Jersey's state barge, <laughs> <laughs> um, which wasn't a very stately vehicle, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, we had with us a couple of marines because you never know about <laughs> what those damn Frenchies might not get up to. <laughs> so we went and landed on the one of these rocks that had a flagpole, and one of the marines was sent to raise the flag. And it was a boiling hot day, and the poor chap was struggling with this damn thing, and it wouldn't go up. Uh, and the rest of us decided to go in for a swim. <laughs> and uh, I was swimming next to the bailiff of Jersey, who was a real Jersey grandee, Sir Alexander Coutonge, VC twice over, I think. Heaven knows how many other decorations. Wonderful good old-fashioned gent. <laughs> and he and I were swimming in the sea when quite suddenly he vanished. And I've always been proud of, of guessing what had happened. That the, the Marine had won, the flag was fluttering at the flagpole, <laughs> and the bailiff had come to attention in the water and gone down like <laughs> <laughs> he popped up again, all right. <laughs> um, that's really all that, about all I can remember of that visit. Um, the whole thing was uh, tremendous fun. And poor Emlyn Wade, who was the least suspicious person you could possibly imagine, when we came back to England, the customs really, well, he must have looked like somebody else, I think. The customs really went for him. And they even opened his resort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. Um, so, that was a, a happy outing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sounds quite exciting. Yeah. Yes. Um, Professor Hirsch Lattepa, did you cross his path at all? Oh, Hirsch? yes, yes. He was a, he was a lovely man. Um, very kindly man um, uh, charming, unselfish helpful to everybody Professor Jonovitz was telling me how relaxed he was actually Hirsch Lauterpacht laid back almost oh yes absolutely very kindly uh, he was he was uh, uh, Emlyn Wade was um, the most decent member of the faculty and Hirsch Lauterbach was the nicest, I think. So interesting. I mean, when mm. you consider his stature, yes. um, you sort of imagine a sort of Germanic lawyer, you know, I yes. would have thought he would have been different, but mm. from others' accounts as well, he was delightful. Mm. Interesting. And she was a pianist, yeah. Lady Lauterbach. I think she'd been a professional pianist and she used to give well since I came back to Cambridge which is oh lord it's now 30 something years but she was still alive when, when we came back and she was still occasionally giving recitals Gosh. not in public halls but in yeah. her own home and it, with invited audiences mm. Gosh Someone else who springs to mind is Professor Duff. Yes. Do, do, do you recall him at all? Oh, yeah, indeed. I knew him very well. He um, he wasn't my tutor in the Cambridge sense, but he um, taught me Roman law and was my director of studies, for heaven's sake, this ghastly language that we use. Do we still talk about drugs and stuff? Yes. bet we do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yes. He will... Um, he was a funny man. He was a classical scholar by upbringing. Um, and took to the law because when he did his bar exams, he did well enough to get um, one of his grand scholarships that the inns give. Oh. And um, so he read law <laughs> and um, became a law tutor. He was a... He lived... I don't think he got to his 90s, but he was well on in his 80s when he died. Um, he lived in Trinity in rooms which looked down the bowling green, the fellow's bowling green there, which is, oh, yes. you go under the clock tower. And, um, and uh, there was... a terrible old cleric called F.A. Simpson who went round pruning things to the despair of all the gardeners and college gardeners in Cambridge, I think. But the Trinity gardeners suffered most. <laughs> and once I was in my rooms which looked down over the bowling green and there was a squeak, squeak and this was... A, um, F.A. Simpson pruning with a long pruner and then I heard the patter of little feet from the, the rooms below me and so I kept watching and Patrick Duff shot out in his I think he was in his pyjamas seized this long pruner he brought with him a can of oil oiled it carefully and then gave it back to Simpson <laughs> Uh, Patrick Duff, he never, uh, I don't, uh, he never wrote anything. By and large, the law fellows of Trinity didn't write anything in those days. Mm -hmm. Harry Holland didn't write anything. Patrick Duff wrote one article which I thought was extremely insightful, but um, what the Romanists think of it, I have no idea. Um, Do you remember the, the title of that article, Professor Nelson? It was probably something to do with furtum, F-U-R-T-U-M, furtum, theft. Theft. Um, and it was really about why theft was treated as a delict, a tort, rather than as a crime. And that was because most thieves were slaves, mm. and therefore their masters were able to pay up. <laughs> and it was a simple thought but very yes. convincing <laughs> um, I don't know where it's published it's probably in the Cambridge Law Journal if you've got an old who's who you would probably find find it under his uh, yes. entry thank you I don't think I can... No, I'm sure I am. I'd have a look in the index to the mm. Cambridge Law Journal. Sure. It's John mm. Topfall. Sure. Thank you. Professor Wilson, did you ever come across David Dalber in your... Oh, yes, book? absolutely. Um, he's, he's, you know, was a mentor to Peter Stein, and, um, of course, he was a PhD student with Professor Lipstein. Yes. In fact, Kurt abandoned... Roman law because of Dalba. Yes. <laughs> and then, of course, um, Professor Jolovitz yes. knew him because of the association with his father. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yes, yes uh, David 
Daba was uh, the story as I was told it, and I'm sure it is substantially true, is that Buckland hired an aeroplane and flew off to, I can't remember now which German university it was that Daba was working in, and just brought him back. <laughs> um, because uh, you know he wouldn't have survived long. No. Um, and uh, got him a fellowship at Keys. Buckland was a man who got what he wanted out of everything. <laughs> <laughs> so Keys made Darba a fellow. Um, uh, and. I think I'm right in saying that he became Regis Professor in Cambridge for a short time, but uh, he went off to Oxford uh, and was Regis Professor there and died there, I think. I think he went to, he actually went to California. You're right. Yes. Absolutely right. He went to, he went to this great uh, Institute the, the, for the, Roman the, Law. The Robbins. Yeah. Yes. And uh, he and uh, a couple of other eccentrics lived in huge luxury. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I can imagine. You're absolutely yeah. right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was a very sweet man, Dharma. Um, in wartime, um, not many dons invited their pupils to their houses for drinks or anything else because supplies were short. But David Dabba asked me to tea and um, I knocked on the door and it was opened apparently by an enormous dog mm -hmm. which was sitting there regarding me. <laughs> and scared out of my wits I said, lovely doggy. <laughs> <laughs> And a small voice from by the door said, Yes, indeed, a beautiful animal, is it not? <laughs> this was David Dabba's little boy, aged about five. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um... I can't remember who else you've got on the list then. Um, I think in terms of faculty who might have taught you in that time, that's probably all I have on my list for the moment. Mm. Of course there are other colleagues when you were in a later stage mm. as an academic, but in 1944 you joined the Naval Intelligence can you talk about the circumstances of this work and what it entailed? It entailed finding out about places that we hoped we might one day recapture or capture. Mm. And... Um, It was actually quite exciting. Um, it, the outfit concerned had started in the School of Geography in Oxford, but the School of Geography was tiny. And from there they moved into Manchester College, which is a Unitarian. And there weren't any, in the war, there weren't many Unitarians. I think there were a couple. Um, <laughs> so... Um, the, the space of the Admiralty occupied uh, that and then they outgrew that and went, went, I was in one of the huts that they Nissen huts that they had on the end of the Balliol cricket pitch on Jowett Walk and um, it was a very very um, whoever it was who was educated in the, the, the holidays from Eton 
Um, I think in a way I was educated on the bed of cricket bed. <laughs> 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 it was, um, I was, I just graduated, they interviewed me for this job and I missed my Buckland lecture and I got the job and I went. And uh, there was one other recent graduate, a girl who uh, just graduated from um, LMH. Uh, everybody else was really pretty senior and most of them were uh, in the military one way or another. Um, so that I and my fellow victim were being paid, I think we were being paid £250 a year. And all these other chaps were lolling around in, the, in their service outfits with their service incomes. <laughs> <laughs> so it had its moments of hardship and annoyance. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it was very interesting. They were very interesting people. My the boss of of my hut. This was how we thought of it. Um, was a major of marines who had been horribly wounded, um, and could just about walk with two sticks. But um, and he was a wonderful man. Um, I always remember uh, some very big brass covered in gold braid came in to ask what we were doing and my boss explained and my boss said of course we try and do it in words of one syllable and gold braid said yes well but of course nobody below the rank of major is going to read your output. That's just what I mean. <laughs> so, um, that was fun. It was a silly thing to say of a wartime job, but it was actually fun. Um, one of my fellows in that hut was a man called Frank Stubbings, who I think think is, no he died a year or two ago he was um, a fellow of Emma a classic and he, he married a girl while they were in that hut together um, we had Norwegians Dutch, French, um, it really was extremely interesting and I really wish that Mr Rumsfeld could have uh, had a similar training because uh, one of the, one of the things that we were concentrating on was that uh, if you hoped to get back then it was good to know where the gun emplacements were and all that sort of thing. But also it would be good if you could take it without totally alienating the population. So we had to know exactly where the power station was and the waterworks and the gas works. Yes. Uh, and so that our people could make sure they survived undamaged. <coughs> and that, that was, uh, it was really very interesting. Fascinating. And um, uh, if you build a, a power station, uh, as we learnt, you write it up in some technical journal. So we had all, all the details. <laughs> all we had to do was to find the right journal. <laughs> uh, and um, we used to... Uh, some other 
outfit got us the names of people who had lived in all these places. And we used to get them and ask them uh, where things were and all that. And it was very interesting. Um, mostly they were not much help. Yes. Um, we discovered that the ones who were most help were those who'd done Pelmanism courses. Pelmanism was quite a thing in the in the forties. Uh, they could probably tell you how many steps it was from the harbour to the power station. <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. Yes. So, and from that I came back to Trinity. And according to... I the went to the Sades. Uh, did you not go, were you not called to the bar first? I was. Um... I, I I did all the work for that, and Trinity kindly put me up. Right. Um, I had no claim on them at all, but they didn't have many. They had a lot of spare rooms. <laughs> <laughs> they were quite glad to better get a bit of rent. <laughs> <laughs> so at that stage, you were actually quite serious about your legal career. Oh yes, oh, I was. I was going to the bar. Yes. I was going. I should have stuck to it. I was planning to use my what remained of my scientific background to try and get into the patent bar. Right. That would have been which is a tiny bar earning a fortune. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I should have stuck to that. <laughs> <laughs> However. Well, after being called to the bar, Professor Wilson, you spent a year in the States at the University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. You were 24 years old then, and you were awarded the Harkness Commonwealth Scholarship to study legal history at the University of Pennsylvania. Well, it was just a, the Harkness, the Commonwealth Fund Fellowships, they're now the Harkness Fellowships. Um, they told you where to go um, ah. on the basis of a person that you were going to, to be, as it were, supervised by, helped by. And uh, the natural person for me in the States was um, uh, S.E. Thorne, the, the main legal historian of the time. Um, but he was in England that year. <laughs> 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 so uh, I went instead to a man called George Haskins, who was at Penn, the Penn Law School. Uh, he, he, His father had... C. H. Haskins was a, one of the great historians of Normandy, and um, uh, George was wonderful. He never he never did anything except answer when I went in and say, "Look, um, where should I look for information about this?" And he always knew, um, uh, and. I mean, the answer very often might be, you know, Holdsworth, Volume 7, <laughs> perhaps page 318. <laughs> 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 he, he was obviously flicking through the pages in his mind. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Astonishing. The amazing man. Um, he, he died some years ago. I had a lovely time in uh, Penn Law School. I was in very comfortable digs. Probably different to the sort of circumstances at Trinity. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I had to eat out the whole time because my digs weren't providing it. I think, I think she gave me breakfast. I'm not even sure of that, actually. I think I went to an establishment called Horn and Hardard for my breakfast, <laughs> <laughs> which was a sort of supermarket eatery, if you know what I mean. Um, and I sent off my dissertation 
from Penn for the Trinity Prize Fellowship, and to my astonishment got it. Um, Harry Holland's doing, I think. <laughs> but I, I but, wondered whether you'd written it at Penn, whether it be, the the whether the work had been done while you were in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. Place. And it was sent off to Old Plucknett for an opinion, uh, and he was kind about it. One general conclusion that I can surmise is that you acquired an admiration for the US system because you went back many times in the course of your career. What is it that attracted you, Professor Wilson, to this to the university system there? Well it's nice to be asked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the main thing, I think. Um, uh, an invitation to go and visit for a year or three months or whatever was uh, always fun. And the LSE, where I was teaching at first, were very good about letting me go, provided they didn't have to pay me. Well, the American universities were always paying me more for a term than I got in three years at the <laughs> LSE, so that was OK. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I... Yes, I, I, I think the American legal system still has, I suppose they would say it was the spirit of free enterprise or something, which English lawyers have rather lost. Yes. Um, we're all a bit hidebound. Yeah. And uh, they go for it, which is fun. Yeah, Professor Stein used to very much enjoy his visits to the States, Virginia, Baton Rouge... Several mm. places. Mm. Um, um, they they all remember him there. Mm. Um, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 um, you returned to Cambridge in 1948, where you were then awarded the York Prize, and that is presumably the dissertation that you. Wrote. That was the same dissertation as got me the Prize Fellowship at Trinity. Yes. And then you became a fellow at Trinity in 1948 and you stayed there as a lecturer until 1955. What subjects did you teach in those days, Professor Wilson? <laughs> oh, goodness me. Did, were you I, I taught almost everything, I think. Could you concentrate on legal history? Well, yes, but uh, I mean, I tried to, but um, it's always been a very optional subject and... Most people who are planning to make their livelihood at the law don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to teach all kinds of real things. Um, Did you find when you returned... I think I taught Tony Jolovich contract. Unbelievable, though, it sounds. And I'm sure it damaged him forever. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that the place had changed much since you'd been away, or not really? I mean, England just began to emerge really after the well, four years. Uh, what had, what mainly changed was that, whereas when I was an undergraduate, there were no, virtually no undergraduates. Uh, now there were lots of them, but they were all mostly in their thirties, because they were returned warriors. Right. Uh, so that it was, uh, again, uh, all abnormal still. Yes. Interesting. So, Vicky Dias mentioned that as well. And um, Kurt Lipstein was telling me how difficult it was sometimes to accommodate people who 
had had positions in the army. Yes. And um, then they had to sort of fall into line, so to speak. Um, well, mostly they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if you were, uh, more difficult for Kurt, because he was older than them. I was younger than them. Uh, and they they didn't expect me to tell them anything. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> uh, yeah. They expected to come and ask me questions and get their essays written that way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember Kurt at all from that time? Any... Oh, yes. Uh, I remember, I mean, Kurt was... Um, when I was an undergraduate, I can't remember exactly. I suppose he supervised me in international law, which I detested. <laughs> <laughs> Even Kurt couldn't make it. <laughs> um, he probably supervised me in all kinds of unexpected things, because... Uh, there was nobody around. There was Kurt and Glanville, each with a little office in the upper gallery of the square where they did their supervisions. Um, there was a man called Fraser Roberts at Corpus who I think was ill and he lectured on contract. And otherwise it was Buckland or me, if you see what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> in anyone else who springs to mind from that period? Sorry? In anybody else, any other colleagues who spring to mind from that period? Well, you, you listed Wally Tuka. He was an extraordinary figure. I think he was ill. He's the only man I ever knew who actually lectured from that rather grand um, lecture thing with a sounding board that I think stands in the summer in the square. Yeah, I think it's now in the square foyer. That's right. Yes. Yes. And he was the only person I ever knew who actually used it. <laughs> um, and I don't think it made much difference whether one heard him or not. <laughs> um, who else? Henry Barnes, of course, Henry Barnes. Um who had been ejected, he'd been a fellow of Jesus, and ran off with the master's wife or daughter, I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, anyway, he had to set up a teaching heaven knows how many hours a week um, from rooms in Sydney Street, if I remember rightly. And he he did lecture in... He lectured on criminal law. Um, he was an exciting lecturer rather than a useful one. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about Henry Barnes was exciting. He was rumoured to have been president of Mexico for a few days. <laughs> it's more than possible. <laughs> he was a great figure. Um, who else have we got on your list? I recently interviewed Judge Stephen Schwabel, who was a student at Trinity from 1950 to 51. And... Um, he was, of course, very enamoured with Trinity. Did, did he cross your path at all, Professor Nelson? 
If so, I can't remember it. Um, do, do you recall any of the weekenders who used to supplement teaching? I know that Professor Jonovitz was one of those. Um, any lot of practice to do weekend teaching? Any of those, perhaps? I mainly remember it as an undergraduate of well, um, your your time as a lecturer came to an end in 1955 and you were appointed to a position at New College, Oxford. Yes, I, I, uh, I went for a, year, for a year to LSE oh, in between. In between. Mm. And I, I thought perhaps we could, we could deal with that in our next interview, Professor Nelson. Right. As we've managed to cover quite a bit of ground. Okay. And all that remains is for me to thank you so much for a fascinating account. I'm really very grateful to you, and I'm really looking forward to the next interview. Being bored further. Thank you so much.